It's that time of the week where we once again take on a Jim Williams analog IQ test. Today we're looking at question 14. The circuit shown in figure 9 senses temperature and provides an amplified analog output. Which component is the sensor and how does the circuit work? If we look at the circuit in figure 9, we can see that the right half of the circuit is comprised of these three op amps and they're in a very typical instrumentation amplifier configuration. And we can also see that the two inputs to this instrumentation amplifier are coming from this left half of the circuit, which is composed primarily of these four transistors. And if we look closely, we can see that these two top transistors are diode connected. So they have uh, their collectors uh, tied directly to their bases. And this is very common in temperature sensing circuits because uh, when you have a diode connected transistor, uh, you can use its change in base emitter voltage over temperature to pretty accurately sense temperature changes. These two bottom transistors appear to be uh, set for current sinks. So you have a current sink for this top transistor and another current sink for this other top transistor. So I think the left half of that circuit with the four transistors is responsible for sensing temperature changes. And this is a pretty easy theory to test. I have that left half of the circuit built up here on the, on the bench, and I have the multimeter connected across those two points in the circuit that would go into the differential amplifier. And we'll see if the voltage across those two points significantly changes as temperature changes. So we can see the voltage there is dropping pretty drastically and still going down. And as this circuit kind of warms back up, we should see that uh, differential voltage start going back up towards zero. And there it goes. So yeah, I think this half of the circuit is absolutely responsible for sensing temperature changes. And this all generally agrees with the answer for question 14 in the book. Uh, which says that the difference in the sensor's VBEs will be linear and highly predictable with temperature, and that the op amps constitute an instrumentation amplifier. However, this is a bit of an unsatisfying answer. For example, why do we have two temperature sensing transistors? Why not just have one transistor to sense the changes in VBE over temperature? Likewise, if we look at the current sinks for these two transistors, they're different. They're, they're configured for different currents. And we can tell that pretty easily because the bases of both of these are tied together, which means they'll be at the same potential, which means that both of these emitters are going to be at the same potential. However, if we look, these emitter resistors, which are tied to the same point here, are of different values. So they'll both have the same voltage across them, but they're going to have different currents. In fact, this one's half the size of this one, so it'll have twice the current. So what is the significance of having two sensing transistors running at a two to one current ratio. Well, I think the easiest way to figure this out is to try and build our own temperature sensor and see how it works. And if we take a diode, or in this case, a diode connected transistor, we can use the change in base emitter voltage to detect changes in temperature. And we can see in this graph here how temperature affects the voltage across a PN junction, whether it be a diode or a base emitter in a BJT. Now, this is a very common uh, plot of current versus voltage for a diode, and you've probably seen this before. Uh, and I have uh, one plot done here at uh, 25 degrees Celsius, and it, this isn't a scale, uh, by the way. But um, we can see that if we hold the current constant, in other words, we have some sort of constant current source or current sink, that as temperature changes, this graph changes as well. If we have a positive temperature change, we can see that the graph shifts to the left. In other words, the voltage across that PN junction will drop. Likewise, if temperature increases, we can see that the graph shifts to the right. Uh, in other words, the voltage across that PN junction will increase. And as long as we hold this current constant, that uh, change in voltage uh, over temperature is actually quite linear. And this is typically specified as approximately two millivolts per degree Celsius. So let's actually build the circuit up on the bench and see how well it adheres to this plot. 
All right, I've got the board built up and hooked up inside the oven here. So we'll turn it on and see how this thing responds over temperature. Now I'm monitoring the base emitter voltage of the transistor under test here. We can see it's currently just over 500 millivolts. And I'm also monitoring the temperature inside the oven down here so that I can see how the base emitter voltage changes as I ramp up the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius. All right, well, I ran that same temperature test four times on three different transistors, and I've got a whole bunch of data points. So let's see what that data is actually telling us. Now, I use this same circuit with the same uh, collector resistor uh, and same voltage source for all of these tests, with the exception of this last one where I swapped out the resistor for a smaller one in order to bump up the collector current. The first one I ran this against was a 2N2222. Uh, I was running it at 10 microamps of collector current, and its VBE at 25 degrees Celsius was 501 millivolts. And its average change in VBE per degree Celsius was 2.65 millivolts. However, when I did this exact same test, right, exact same uh, configuration, exact same collector current with a different 2N2222, um, the change in VBE was pretty much the same, but look at the intercept here. The VBE at 25 degrees Celsius was almost 10 millivolts lower. Likewise, when I used a completely different transistor, uh, an S9018, again, same collector current, same resistor, same everything, um, the VBE at 25 degrees Celsius was 625 millivolts, and the change in VBE per degree Celsius was 2.2 millivolts. And even using that exact same transistor, not you know the same mod, not the same uh, type, just the exact same transistor, but running it at a different collector current here, 100 microamps instead of 10, um, both of those values changed again. Um, the VBE at 25 degrees Celsius jumped up to 685 millivolts, and the change in VBE dropped down to 1.9 millivolts per degree Celsius. So what this is all telling us is you can't rely on the change in VBE uh, to really get any kind of accurate temperature measurement uh, unless you want to characterize each individual transistor that you're going to use in your circuit. And if you're at all familiar with Shockley's diode equation, none of this should be terribly surprising. In our diode connected transistor, the emitter current is of course equal to the sum of the collector and base currents. Now, the diode equation says that that is going to be equal to the reverse bias saturation current of the PN junction uh, times Euler's number here raised to uh, the VBE voltage, the base emitter voltage, over N, which is an ideality factor, which is uh, usually approximated as 1, um, times uh, K, which is Boltzmann's constant, uh, multiplied by um, the temperature in Kelvin, over Q, which is the charge on an electron, and all of that minus one. Now that might seem kind of complicated, but it's really not too bad, and we can simplify it a bit. Uh, first of all, uh, the base current is usually very small, so usually we throw that out and just say that the collector current is equal to this equation. Um, also, uh, this minus one is usually eliminated uh, because the base emitter voltage is usually very large with respect to this part down here. So uh, 
uh, this minus one really is negligible. So you often see that completely eliminated as well. And as I mentioned, this ideality factor here, n, is usually one, um, or it is at least ideally one. Um, now, interestingly, in diodes, this tends to be a bit larger, closer uh, to two. However, in diode-connected transistors, it tends to be lower. So, you know, a little bit ironically, a diode-connected transistor is closer to the ideal ideality factor of one than a diode is. So if you're wondering why we're using diode-connected transistors instead of just a diode, that's why. Uh, but since this is usually approximated as one, we can just throw that out as well. And so we have this simplified equation down here um, where our only uh, variables here are IS, IC, um, VBE, and of course, temperature. So if we rearrange this simplified equation to solve for VBE, we can see that the base emitter voltage is dependent on a couple of constants here, uh, Boltzmann's constant and the charge on an electron. And there are three variables, uh, temperature, the collector current, and the reverse bias saturation current. Now, we know that uh, we need to hold the collector current constant, so we'll consider that a constant uh, for purposes of this discussion. Um, so really, the, the only variable it looks like we have here is temperature and the reverse bias saturation current. And same with solving for temperature, right? Uh, temperature is dependent on VBE, IC and IS, and Q and K are constants. So the question is, what is IS? Now, a lot of times in textbooks or online, you might see uh, IS treated as a constant, but it's really not in practice. Uh, it's heavily dependent on the physical and chemical properties of the PN junction, and that's going to change from one batch of transistors to another, not to mention um, you know, going between two totally different transistor types. Uh, it's also dependent on temperature, so um, it will change over temperature. In fact, the change in base emitter voltage over temperature is not dominated by T. It's dominated by the change in IS over temperature. So this is actually highly variable, and it's the main source of error that we were seeing in our previous measurements. But there is a way to eliminate the IS variable from our equations by using two diode-connected transistors running at two different collector currents. Now recall, this is the simplified equation for calculating a collector current. Now if we have two different currents, uh, and we take the ratio of those two, IC2 to IC1, we end up with this. Uh, we have a, nu a numerator and a denominator, and really the only difference between the two is that they'll have two different VBEs, VBE1 and VBE2. But most importantly, notice that IS is a common term, so it's going to cancel out, leaving us with this. And if we rearrange this equation here to get the VBEs on one side, we can see that the difference in the two base emitter voltages, or delta VBE, is equal to KT over Q times the natural log of the ratio of our two collector currents. So as long as we hold this ratio constant, the only variable here is temperature. And so by measuring delta VBE, we can very easily and accurately calculate temperature. So for all this to work, we need to have two transistors with the same IS in order for that IS term to cancel out. Now that might seem like it doesn't really gain us anything, but it does because we can have a matched pair. Uh, whether you're uh, you know, making an IC or you, know, you just go on DigiKey, you can buy matched pairs of transistors. And as long as IS is the same between those two particular transistors, you're fine. Right? If you buy a matched pair today, they might have a totally different IS value than the matched pair you buy tomorrow, but it doesn't matter because relative to each other, IS is the same. Likewise, we only care about the relative collector currents. We don't care about the absolute values. We just need to keep the ratio of these two collector currents the same. So what we've done here is we've eliminated the need to have absolute accuracy, and we only need to have relative accuracy. The downside to this is that if we eliminate IS, remember that was the main cause of changes in our base emitter voltages over temperature. So once we eliminate that, the base emitter voltage changes 
are going to be much smaller on the order of microvolts. So when you're measuring things down in microvolts, you have to be much more careful about things like common mode noise and that sort of thing. So you do typically have to have some sort of uh, instrumentation amplifier or other uh, accurate differential amplifier with a high common mode uh, noise rejection ratio um, in order to amplify these lower um, voltages up for uh, either reading on a multimeter or putting into an ADC or something like that. So that's really the only downside is that you know we just have to be uh, a little more careful with our measurements and we have to be uh, a little more worried about noise and things like that. Uh, but this does allow us to have much more accurate temperature measurements based on the base emitter voltage drops. To demonstrate this, instead of using two different uh, matched transistors, I'm just going to be using one. And all I'm going to do is have two resistors wired in parallel here between the collector and VCC. And I'll have a little switch here so I can switch one of them in and out of the circuit. So with the switch open, I only have one one mega ohm resistor here, and so that'll be one collector current, and that'll give us one reading for VBE. With the switch closed, these two are now in parallel, that will double the current and we get a second reading for VBE. So we'll then be able to take those two different VBE readings, plug them into our equation with this two to one collector ratio and see how accurate it is. And I'm currently monitoring the base emitter voltage from our little test circuit here on this multimeter. And you can see when I push the switch, the base emitter voltage changes because we're changing the collector current there. And all I'm going to do is measure that change in base emitter voltage when I push the button. And we'll compare that delta VBE to the actual temperature uh, as measured from this MCP9700 uh, temperature sensor board, uh, which is being displayed here on this second multimeter. And so just by taking that delta VBE measurement, we can plug it into our equation and see how accurately um, that matches the actual temperature in the room. So if you can decipher my scribbles here, you can see I did uh, five different tests using those same three transistors that I used in the previous experiment. And I did run them uh, at different VCC values to give them different collector currents, uh, just to make sure that the collector current, the absolute value of the collector currents, uh, didn't make a difference. And for each measurement I took, I did uh, three measurements for each of these five tests for a total of 15. Uh, I just noted the delta VBE, uh, the current temperature, and I also wrote down here uh, on the far left the expected delta VBE. So if we look uh, at a summary here, we can see that uh, the calculated temperature based on the delta VBE was within, on average, 0.86 degrees Celsius of the actual measured temperature in the room uh, based on uh, the MCP 9700 temperature sensor. Now you can see here we have a pretty wide range of error. Um, a couple of these are you know within 0.1 degrees of the measured uh, temperature. Some of them are as far out as you know one or two degrees and that's most likely me screwing up. Uh, as I mentioned you know these measurements can be kind of difficult to make and you have to be very uh, cautious and careful about things like noise because we're measuring things down in the microvolt range. Um, and I really wasn't that careful <laughs> with these measurements. I really just hooked everything up to the multimeters and wrote down the uh, values that I saw. Even so, this is much better than what we were getting before. And more importantly, it's consistent across different transistors and at different collector currents. Uh, so with all that said, hopefully this circuit makes a lot more sense now. Uh, we have two diode connected transistors here both being run at two different collector currents. The difference between those two is then being fed into this instrumentation amplifier, uh, which gives good common mode noise rejection and amplifies that small voltage change up in order to be fed into an ADC or read off a multimeter or what have you. And that brings us to the end of another analog IQ test. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. This was a particularly fun one to do. Uh, if you did and you want to see more videos like it, be sure to click the subscribe button. And as always, if you have any questions, suggestions, or corrections, leave them in the comments section below. Thanks for watching.